Hey folks, Professor Finn here, and today we're going to be looking at Chapter 15 of Ralph Clicker's Funeral Service Psychology and Counseling Textbook. Let's get the presentation up and start discussing Intervention Counseling. So, important definitions, a crisis, a temporary period of heightened psychological accessibility, a highly emotional state in which an individual's feelings of anxiety, grief, confusion, or pain impairs his or her ability to act, a person is less defensive than usual and more open to outside intervention and change. In a crisis intervention is the immediate assessment and short-term treatment for individuals experiencing a crisis with the goal of returning the person to their pre-crisis level of functioning. So a crisis is usually short-term, four to six weeks, usually stimulated by an outside precipitator or emotionally hazardous situation. The more seriously threatening the event, the greater the likelihood that primitive coping behavior will be exhibited. Normal reactions such as fear, tension, confusion, or discomfort to an abnormal hazardous event. It is not the actual event, but it is the person's perception of it and the threat it represents. People in crisis tend to pull away from significant others at a time when positive interpersonal relationships help resolve crises and the lack of them prolongs the crisis. So what are some potential crises? Well, first up, we have the obvious natural disasters. Floods, hurricanes, tsunamis, fires, earthquakes. So when I lived in Florida, flooding, hurricanes, that, 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 that was an annual experience. Uh, really have not lived through a tsunami and really don't have wildfires in Florida. One time driving back to Miami, there were some fires going on down south near the Everglades, and that was kind of a problem because they shut down the major highways going uh, across the state. Uh, and almost never have earthquakes, have never experienced an earthquake in my life. Here in Texas, now there are some flood areas, don't take me wrong. Uh, hurricanes, they blow through here now and then. Maybe I get one in a year, or if it blows through, by the time it hits me in North Texas, it's usually not that bad. But tornadoes, that's a completely different thing. Now I have to worry about the tornado siren. There's also man-made crises, homicides, suicides, accidents, terrorist attacks, medical events, heart attacks, strokes, SIDS even. Now, crisis is not the event. It is how one perceives the event. What may be a crisis to one person may not be a crisis to another one. We see this all the time. Someone starts freaking out and someone next can be like, dude, are you okay? Like, it's really not that bad. That person is perceiving the events differently. Most people will recover provided there is support, guidance, and resources they need. Most cases will involve reactions that are normal and understandable to an abnormal situation. So what are some factors to consider regarding potential crises? What are the statistics? What is the mortality? The more death and destruction? More potential for unhealthy responses? What is the time? The greater the duration, the greater the problem. The spatial aspect, the closer the person is to the tragedy, greater the stress. Reoccurrence, the more perceived the likelihood that the tragedy will happen again, the greater the intense fear contributing to the stress. Seasonal influences, holidays make a big difference. If it happens in April, who cares? It happens at Christmas, huge problem. Racial considerations, culture may cause extra stress. And cause of death, the manner of death may cause extra stress as well. As research, as research discovers new info, perceptions and responses can change. Medicine is one of those areas that has largely changed how we look at things. So people came back from the Civil War, World War I, World War II, and some people were just off. And we, don't, we didn't know what was happening, what to call it, etc. Now we recognize something called post-traumatic stress disorder. This is not limited to people in the military, although the people with military service, especially uh, active service uh, in a battlefield environment, have a high likelihood of encountering a post-traumatic stress disorder. 
but post-traumatic stress disorder can easily be found in the ranks of funeral directors and embalmers as well. We are generally always looking at very gruesome things, and fields that encounter the same things like us with even heightened stress will also have PTSD, law enforcement, firefighter EMT, etc., etc., etc. Now that we know about PTSD, now we can find ways to treat it. And here we have a picture of uh, the trenches in World War I with someone smiling and laughing, and that is because they are what is termed back then shell-shocked. They are shattered mentally and absolutely mad in their mind. Myths and misconceptions can exacerbate response to the crisis. Misinformation is bad. And the most common one, especially in older textbooks, is AIDS only affects alternative lifestyles. It only affects gay people. And growing up in the 80s, that was a prevalent statement. And realistically, it has nothing to do with that. AIDS is a blood-borne pathogen. It is transmitted by bodily fluids. And lots of people got AIDS because we didn't know how to track AIDS. And they got contaminated blood. Misinformation these days, depending on who you talk to, certainly don't want to talk to me about that, where I'll tell you, you really can't trust anything you read from, every, from anybody, which creates the issue that what happens when you doubt everyone? Well, becomes a problem, which is why you really don't want people providing misinformation. Grieving challenges include the cause of death, Investigation and interrogation, police interviews don't help the situation when you have a traumatic event. The severity of the loss, the relational problem, family relations can cause severe issues. Why weren't you watching your brother? If you were paying attention, they wouldn't have fallen in the pool. Well, the same goes for you, mom or dad, that something tells me their seven-year-old sibling should not be the person responsible for making sure that the pool gate is closed and locked. What are some typical reactions following a crisis? Anxiety, fear, panic, anger. Things we've seen before. Typical grief reactions. Emotional numbing, difficulty sleeping, waking throughout the night, nightmares or daydreaming. Exhaustion or mental fatigue, changes in appetite, disbelief or denial of events. Reliving images of the traumatic event, dwelling on the event being easily angered or upset. So today is September 11th, 2024. And on September 11th, 2001, planes were crashed into the World Trade Centers, and a lot of people died. It was a very bad day. Well, those of us who lived through that, we can tell you where we were, who we were with, what we were doing, all of that usually with some level of clarity. Time does dull certain aspects, but for the most part, we remember a lot about that moment. My aunt, who lives in Massachusetts, was alive when President John F. Kennedy was shot in Texas. And she could tell you exactly what she was doing, who she was with, etc., when she found out that Kennedy was shot. That is a typical reaction following a crisis. Depression or worsening of depression. Problems concentrating, accident proneness, increasing frustration or impatience. A tendency to isolate or withdraw. Neglecting responsibilities. Reluctance to assume responsibilities. Fear or reluctance to be open or talk. Episodes or outbursts of crying or sadness. Fear or reluctance to be open or talk. Looks like I copy and pasted that one again by accident. Episodes or outbursts of crying or sadness. Fear or reluctance to express emotions. Headaches, stomach aches or indigestion. Children acting younger or less responsible and children returning to bedwetting. This is called regression. They are regressing to an earlier time. It is the equivalent of you 
opening your computer uh, recovery tool and restoring to an earlier date. So all the crisis intervention models very closely relate to each other. So let's talk about the ABC model. So the A is achieve contact with the person. It is the initial contact between the client and the counselor. The major task here is to establish rapport. You want them talking to you. And this is done by conveying genuine respect, trust, and acceptance. Reassure the client can be helped at this time and place. Professor Finn, that, that, that's great. That's nice. That's dandy. I'm going to be a funeral director. I'm not going to be sitting there on the front lines of a natural disaster. Probably not, unless you volunteer for demort or something like that. But remember, a crisis is what someone perceives, not the actual event. A death is a crisis. So when they come in with their crisis, you build rapport, show genuine respect, trust, and acceptance, and show them that you can help. B is boil down the problem to its essentials. Filter out the irrelevant data. Identify major problems. Identify the last straw or the precipitating event. Identify and legitimize the feelings and emotions of the client. This is especially true if you have issues with family uh, communication problems. Past successful methods of coping should be discussed, as well as any factors that may complicate them. Use open-ended questions to bring these things to light. So, do you see what's happening here? The same things that you are using in your everyday practice are things you can also use in crisis counseling. So you are practicing these things by literally doing the job every day. Once the situation is assessed, tell the client, this will relieve anxiety and stress. Most common crisis is rushing to get things done last minute on a funeral. That is the most common thing. Generally, people don't need to have the funeral within 24 hours. Just saying, they don't. And by telling them that most funerals usually are three to five or even seven days from the point of death, it allows people to breathe. They're not trying to rush and get things done. There's too many things to coordinate, too many out-of-state families. Again, they're perceiving a crisis. There is not a crisis. They just need to know that you don't have to do it by tomorrow night. Coping mechanisms should be discussed and implemented. There's your C. Explore and help the client identify coping skills. A prior successful skill may or may not work a second time. Help the client form their own coping skills. Inventory client's resources and determine useful ones. Formulate alternatives if that doesn't work. Plan B, man. Establish goals. Review and refine the plan as necessary. The military has a great saying, no plan survives first contact intact. Review and refine. Take action. Follow up when possible. So what are some negative ways of doing this? Well, giving quick advice. Give answers prior to building rapport. You don't even know what they're talking about, what's going on, and you're already giving answers. Bad way to do it. False assurances. Everything is going to be okay. Everything might not be okay. What can you say instead? I'm here to work through this with you. That is absolutely the truth if you are intending to do that. Bromides. I like bromides. Summarizing complex issues into something simplistic. Responses should be clear, specific, and tailored to the client. There are a lot of the same tools that you can work with your different clients. Fact of the matter is, you have to find out which one of those tools is the best for them and what you need to maybe do with that tool to make it unique to their situation. Do not take a complex issue and try to make it simple. Separate the complex issues into its component parts and address the parts. That is not simple because separating the issue into its component parts is difficult. Asking too many questions or close-ended questions. Judgmental pronouncements tend to ignore the person's real problem. Debating or arguing, it creates distance. Again, you say, Professor Finn, field directors wouldn't do that. Read some of the lawsuits 
that are out there and see how the funeral director treated that family, especially when the funeral director was confronted with negligence or an issue uh, and they were basically dictated or overruled or something like that. Funeral directors are usually the first person, first person a crisis client meets who have any understanding what is going on. This can be anywhere in the process, the removal, the arrangement, etc. You need to be the calming, reassuring environment. Act of viewing the remains can be helpful and therapeutic. It can also be the family's only public expression of love, remembrance, and commemoration. You can help a family in ways no other person can do by simply doing your job right, compassionately, and professionally. That is no joke. Folks, thank you for your time and patience, and we will see you next video.